Hi everyone, Jaleesa Tucker here from the One Love Foundation. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and I'm super excited to start a conversation, a very important conversation today. First and foremost, I wanna say that teen dating abuse can happen to everyone or anyone. It doesn't matter if you have good grades, if you have great friends or strong relationships with your family, anyone can be affected by this issue. In fact, about 1.5 million high school students will experience dating abuse by a dating partner um, each year. And so teen, teen dating abuse is something we're very passionate about talking about here at One Love, and so I'm excited for this conversation. You know, a, a teen in an abusive relationship may not know exactly what's happening to them, right? They may not be familiar with our One Love's 10 signs of an unhealthy or abusive relationship. Um, and more importantly, they may not know what or where to go for help. So when you add pregnancy to the mix, it makes things so much more complicated and can even change the dynamics of the relationship with their partner. So today we're actually gonna be speaking with Nicole Lynn Lewis, author of Pregnant Girl, and Brett Renfrew from Generation Hope. Um, they are two young women, or just women, <laughs> grown women now, um, who thought their lives were over, who were told their lives were older, over when they were younger and found out that they would be teen parents. And today we're actually gonna discuss with them, you know, how they got out of the toxic relationships they had with their partners at the time and overcame, you know, stigma around teen pregnancy to achieve everything that they've achieved today. So I'm super excited to talk to them about their story and also teen dating violence in general. So without further ado, guys, hi, keep waving. <laughs> I am going to get them both on. joining right now. I'm going to get you on in just a second, Brett, and then Nicole. I will request. Hi, Brett. How are you? Hello. Ooh, I can hear you. <laughs> Yay. I'm so happy. <laughs> OMG. So let me find Nicole. Oh. There she is. I'm just going to invite her on. Give it a sec. Awesome. And in the meantime, guys, if you want to go ahead and continue to drop, give us some hearts and some waves and some support. Um, Nicole, I'm going to try and invite you on again. Give this another go. There she is. Oh, hi. hi how are you i'm good i'm glad i can hear you guys <laughs> it's working it's working <laughs> amazing so i'm so glad to be having this conversation with the both of you i think that we are going to open a lot of hearts and minds to, to the signs of abuse and also help a lot of young people know that your life is not over if you know god forbid i mean for you know, goodness forbid, you find out you're going to be teen parents, you know what I'm saying? There's a way forward. So I'm excited to start this conversation. But before we jump in, I'm wondering if you both would like to start by introducing yourselves. Sure. Yeah. I'll defer. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Brett Renfrew. Um, I'm 23 years old. Uh, I am a double major at the University of Maryland, secondary education and history. Um, I'm a teacher at my school. <laughs> and um, I um, had a baby when I was 18. Um, yeah, and he's just great. He's, he's, he's my light, my life, my love. Oh, so, yeah. I love that. I love it too. Um, Thank you for that, Brad. So my name is Nicole Lynn Lewis, and I'm the founder and CEO of a nonprofit organization called Generation Hope. And we help teen moms and dads earn their college degrees in the DC metro area. Brett is one of our amazing scholars. And you can hear, we have so many overachievers and Brett is one of them with a double major in teaching and a mom. Um, and so we get to work with just inspiring students like Brett every single day. Um, and then we advocate nationally for the needs of parenting college students all over the country. About one in five 
college students across the country are parenting. So it's, it's a big group of, of students. Um, and I'm also the author of the book Pregnant Girl that just came out in May. Um, and that book talks about my own journey as a teen mom. So I also got pregnant in high school. And I'm sure like Brett, you know, had so many people telling me that life was over and I wasn't going to be able to do uh, all of these things that I had hoped to do with my life. Um, and so wrote the book about my journey, um, hopefully to inspire people to think differently about what's possible for teen moms and teen dads and to provide support for them to go on and achieve their educational goals, um, whether it's high school or college or beyond. So really excited to be here. That's awesome. I'm so excited to share your stories with everyone. And let's go ahead and get, get started with Nicole. I know you just said that you were the author of Pregnant Girl. Can you tell us, you rewind time in your head, tell us a little bit what it was like when you first found out it was you were pregnant. And also I'm wondering if that also changed the, the, the dynamics of your relationship with your partner at the time. Yeah, so I... Um, to give a little context, so when I found out I was pregnant, I was kind of a rock star student. I was an honor roll student. I was involved in all of these different clubs. I was on the college track, so I had just been accepted into a bunch of different colleges when I found out I was pregnant. Um, and as soon as those, as those two pink lines showed up, it just felt like none of those accomplishments, none of those accolades mattered. You know, people looked at me differently. Um, I became um, uh, kind of a pariah, if you will. Um, you know, at school, people stopped talking to me. Teachers weren't as supportive. Um, and it just totally changed my life, um, not just because of what was physically happening and the fact that, yes, my body was changing and I was going to be a mom. But socially, it just felt like the the support was yanked right out from under me. And I really felt very alone. Um, I just re feeling remember feeling lonely and really worried about what my future was going to hold. Um, and my relationship with my daughter's father, um, you know, it did change because I was a very independent kind of person. Um, I was I was really clear about where I wanted to go in life. And then suddenly, you know, I was going to be a mom. And um, it was it was definitely like um all of the goals that I had for myself, they felt now like they were very threatened, right, by what was happening um, physically for me. And uh, he was he was not in the same headspace that I was, you know, that he, he wasn't thinking about his future in the same way that I was. Um, and, and that was really difficult. It kind of created, in a way, a separation between us that just got worse over time. Um, not that we weren't together, because we were together, but um, just wanting very different things out of life and me realizing and feeling the full responsibility of motherhood and parenting a lot sooner than he did. So it was tough. It was a lot. It was, a, it was extremely stressful. Um, on top of a really stressful relationship already. And there were a lot of things happening in our relationship um, that were red flags. Like, you know, he was um, threatening uh, over over text messages, like when I didn't call him right back. And, um, and he had a real anger problem. And so like, he would, you know, we would argue and he would get kind of out of control with his anger. So the pregnancy just made all of those things kind of get worse. And the emotions run higher um, for both of us, I think. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I totally feel you. I know that a lot of young people, I think, feel like suddenly everything that they have a good head on their shoulders and suddenly everything that they've accomplished up until that point are like nothing or pale in, in comparison to like their current situation. And, you know, that's just not the most helpful, I think, mentality that's sort of pushed on to young people at a very like important and vulnerable time in their lives. So I'm glad that you actually brought that up. Um, and Brett, I definitely wanna hear a little bit about your story. Tell us what was it like when you first realized you got the pink lines and you were pregnant and how did that affect your relationship with your partner at the time? Um, well, for me, it was a little bit um, different cause I had just gone to college um and so um and so my pregnancy came exactly one year after my miscarriage i miscarried right as i was graduating high school and um 
I thought, you know, all these things were wrong with me, my uterus. I thought like I was just, so then when I got pregnant, I was scared for a different reason. I, I was scared because I thought it was going to happen again. And um, so I had like a lot of early pregnancy issues. And so it, it was really rocky in that time. And, um, but I just felt like, really, Brad? Like, you did it again? <laughs> like, I was like, why, why, why? Like, what are you doing? So it was, it was, like, I was embarrassed for myself. Like, I was embarrassed that I had done it again. And I was embarrassed. I thought I was going to lose my friends. Like, they were going to be like, are you kidding? Like, we just went through this. So, um. And with my with my child's father, we already had like a weird relationship. Like it was already weird. And um he was in college out of state. And so he I was like, I have to tell you something and he was like, What? And I told him and he was like, What does that even mean? Like, why are we having this conversation? Like just go get an abortion. And I was like, um, no. And so then um, once I said no, and he realized that it was past 12 weeks, and I really wasn't going to do it, it just got, I mean, it just got as volatile as possible. So um, yeah, we, we just, we just were apart. And yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I would love to hear from the both of you also, you know, once you you went through the pregnancy and so on and so forth, how did the relationship behaviors, the unhealthy relationship behaviors intensify once the baby or your newborn was home? What was that experience like for the both of you? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I um, ended up leaving my parents' home and was kind of um, couch surfing and living place to place with my, my daughter's father when I was pregnant. Um, and I actually, some, you know, similarly, I, I, the first time I was pregnant, I miscarried, um, and then got pregnant again. Um, so I can identify Brett with those feelings of embarrassment and how is this happening? And I talk about in the book too, of just feeling, um, uh, there's a sense when you have a teen pregnancy or, or, or uh, you know, poorly timed pregnancy, however you want to phrase it. Um, and you have a miscarriage, the feelings, the, uh, the conflict around that, you know, internally of you're mourning this baby and this life that many people felt shouldn't have been here in the first place and, and how difficult those emotions can be. And so I can totally identify with what Brett was sharing. Um, when I did get pregnant again, you know, one thing that, that happened very quickly was that I was constantly alone. So um, he was uh, always gone, like he would be gone for days, and I would have to like, figure stuff out on my own. I didn't have money. I didn't have food all the time. Um, I didn't have a great friend um, support system because of my pregnancy. And so uh, my friendships were spotty. And I just remember throughout the pregnancy, just feeling incredibly isolated, and really alone. And, um, and he was out in the world. And that was, again, just a, a big difference in our experiences. And that was really hard for me. Um, and then I think I had this expectation that once the baby came that he would start to feel that responsibility of being a dad and start to say, okay, now I want to be around more. And of course, that wasn't the case. Like, I remember as soon as I had him being in the hospital that night, that first night with her, and it was my mom and I, you know, he was around when she was born. And then shortly after that, he had somewhere to go. Um, and really, my mom in that first week was was doing all the things that you would hope that, you know, your your partner would be doing. Um, so he did not feel that same um, sense of like, OK, my baby's here and now I need to to be here for this this little this child, this little one. That also caused a lot of stress in our relationship because, of course, the parenting responsibilities fell on me. You know, I was having to be mom and dad, and I was having to do it at a time when I needed support. You know, I was trying to heal. I was trying to get sleep. I was nursing. I was a new mom, and how overwhelming that can be no matter how old you are and how much support you have. Um, and he, he wasn't really there for any of it. So it caused a huge stress in our relationship, and um, and... I think 
it was really hard to recover from that from that and again all of this had been building but coming home with a newborn and having to shoulder all of that on my own caused a lot more stress in the relationship gotcha yeah yeah true that um <laughs> because it, it's like it's like a very it's like a very lonely thing when you see women with husbands or women with partners who you see them in all like the like the pregnancy things you go to, like the baby registry things and the pregnancy and the child safety classes and the birthing classes. Like I was going with my mom and they were coming with their husbands and I felt like a fool and I felt embarrassed again. <laughs> and um, so when I was in labor, I had my mom and my friend, shout out to my friend for coming to do labor with me and um he was still in his school at his school and um like he was texting my friend kind of not really and he was trying to like kind of control my labor from this other state and um when like my son was born he texted my friend back he was like it's lit that's what he said and he like didn't check in on us he didn't like do anything for us and so when I came home and I still had to like do everything I just felt like I felt frustrated and I felt like alone I was mad and like sad because I was still grieving the thing is I was still grieving a relationship that I had lost while trying to be a parent to a baby who has half of his DNA so like I was trying to do both things and I was just like and then the postpartum depression came in and like mm -hmm. just like ruined me and so like I still had to do all these things because I wanted to show my son that like you don't give up and so I still went back to school with my nursing baby I was taking finals and like two days or six days after my c-section I was back in class like so with my nursing baby because I didn't have anyone to watch him and so like it was like all these things I felt like I was doing the minimum and like not getting anything any support from it from who I felt I should have been getting support from and yeah. it was just it was like a really sad situation for me because like all your hormones are everywhere still because you you just gave birth to a baby and now you have to deal with like all of this other like emotional trauma and it's just like <laughs> yeah you both are warriors in your own right I have to say I, I think a lot of people would buckle under the pressure of that and I think a lot of people do and you know for good reason it's a lot to do you know newborns are a lot for mature parents by the way older parents um so the fact that you guys were so young with newborns and inconsistent partners who were also controlling uh brett somehow trying to micromanage the situation from another state um and also it's so interesting that their response was it's lit like of all the things you could say <laughs> you know what i'm saying about the birth of your first child or you know, whatever <laughs> Yeah, it's lit. But I also want to just say I'm really grateful and I'm, 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 I appreciate the both of you being so candid about what it was, how you felt, you know, when you found out you were pregnant, having, you know, also had a miscarriage. And simultaneously, Brent, you, you talked a little bit about feeling, you know, mourning, but also shame for the current. So it's almost like you couldn't even celebrate, you know, celebrate the fact that, you know, whether people agree or don't agree about whether the baby should be there or not, it's it's still there and you're still going forward with it. So, you know, you weren't even allowed to kind of, you know, feel okay about that ever, Definitely. it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing I also wanted to kind of talk about or, or touch on and, you know, we can go as far or as deep as you guys want to, but I know reproductive coercion did play a part in both of your relationships. So I definitely wanted to talk a little bit about that. So I was wondering if you guys might be okay with that. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So let's talk about it. Reproductive coercion. Nicole, how about you start? What role did yeah. that play in the relationship? So um, I mentioned I had a miscarriage and um, 
you know, I think when when we lost the the baby, I think both of us, of course, you again, you're you're mourning for this little one. I mean, it wasn't the plan that I had for myself, but getting pregnant had completely turned my life upside down and and um and of course I started to have a connection and care for for what was growing inside of me and you know had pictured being a mother you know all of these things and so um when I lost the baby both of us were really devastated and and um and but then I also started to think about okay this now means that I can move forward or try to move forward with some of the goals that I had like maybe college is back on the table maybe I can you know um uh, accept those acceptance letters and, you know, move forward. And so I started wanting to um, uh, not get pregnant again, wanting to focus on my future and education and things like that. And that is not where my partner wanted to go. He wanted to try to have another baby. He wanted to, you know, even though nothing about our life was set up for a baby, you know, we were couch surfing and um, did not have any stability, but I think emotionally, you know, um, that, that desire was there, but also what I learned just kind of in reflecting back is that it was also a way to control me. It was a way to keep me, um, uh, home, you know, while he was out in the world, it was a way to, um, keep me from doing the things that I really wanted to do, which I think he, he viewed as, as a threat to him and, and to our relationship. Um, and so, uh, he very much wanted me to have, um, to have another child to get pregnant again. Um, so, so I saw it at play in that, like, as it, it was, you know, we wanted very different things at, after that miscarriage. And, um, he would get really angry if I talked about going to college or if he, you know, if I talked about wanting to delay getting pregnant again, um, those were hot topics. Those were things that, I knew not to really go deeply into with him. Right. I'm wondering, Nicole, do you feel like there was a, an element of jealousy there with you going, or was it just, do you think it was just you going to college and him not wanting you maybe to move on was really just about him not wanting to shake up the relationship? Or I wonder if there was like an element of like maybe some jealousy that you get to or are planning to move on and, you know, have this other full life and, you know, maybe he doesn't, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to say, I think what the sense that I got was that I think he knew that if I went and got, I went to college, I started to connect with new networks of people and learn new things and be exposed to new things that I may not want to be in a relationship with him anymore. And we had a very turbulent relationship. It wasn't healthy. And I think, you know, for him, me being at home and pregnant was a way to hold on to that. And me being out in the world and getting my degree and focusing on my goals and meeting new people, I think he knew that 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 it could threaten his ability to keep me and to keep me in the relationship. So, I mean, it could have been some jealousy there, but I think that's the sense that I got mostly was that he saw my goals as... Um, taking me away from him and taking me away from the relationship. Gotcha. Gotcha. Brett, I know you had a similar experience with your partner. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So, uh, like, first, I just want to say, like, if I fumble over my words, it's because this is, like, the first time that I talked about it with people who are not, like, my best friends. Okay. So it's, like, scary because, you know, who knows. But, um... So, like, when when we got together, like, there was a decision made on how we were going to, um, like, protect ourselves. And, um, like, when we first got together, I had made it pretty clear that, like, unless we were being protective, um, I wasn't going to be engaging in any activities that would whatever. Um and he was like, okay, like, we can use protection. That's fine. Like, we'll do that. And then I remember, like, the first time we engaged in those activities, um, he, in the middle, was like, this doesn't feel good. I'm not using this anymore. And he, like, took it off and threw it across the room. So then after that, like, we, he had made this decision for us that we weren't going to use that anymore because it didn't feel great, right? 
So then when I got pregnant the first time, when I had a miscarriage, I was devastated about it. I was so upset. And he's a very like scientific person. He's very particular in what he does. And he was like, I remember he was like, um, I need you to just get over it because it was just a clump of cells. And so I was upset about it and he was not. So when it happened, when we were continuing in the same pattern, um, we, like I was on birth control because I was like, I don't want to like deal with this again. And so, um, yeah, like all the joy for him. And then I was just like taking birth control and then it failed. And um, so when I told him that I was pregnant, he was like, we had had a conversation like about two weeks or two, a week or two before about abortion we had had a conversation with him and i had told him that i uh, support women doing whatever they feel but when i talk think about myself that's not something that i want and he was like okay whatever like that's great so then when i got pregnant he was like so are you gonna have an abortion and i was like no and he was like yes you are and i was like actually i'm not and he was like, oh, okay, like, it's fine. Like, we'll do this together. It's going to be great. We're going to be in love, like, whatever. We're going to have family. We're going to get married, all this stuff. And I was a lot more um, invested in the relationship emotionally than he was. And, I, and he knew it. So he knew that I would do whatever he said. And he thought that he could talk me into getting an abortion. And when, it, when I made it clear that he, I wasn't going to do that, he left me. And so then when after he left me and I wasn't going to get an abortion, he talked about how I was ruining his life, how my religion was ruining his life, how he would like text me and be like, how many weeks are you left until you have the baby due? And I would tell him and he'd be like, I'd be like, why? And he'd be like, just counting down the days until my life is over. Like he was like that kind of when I was pregnant. And so he would talk about me having an abortion up until I gave birth. He was like, well, if you had had an abortion or you should still have an abortion or whatever the case may be. And yeah, he would just like get mad about it if I, when I was like, I'm 20 weeks pregnant. Like, it's not an abortion anymore. It's just weird. So then like when I gave, well, then he would like still try to control the pregnancy, even though he wanted me to have an abortion. Like he would try to control what I ate he was like you should be a vegan you need to be a vegan like it's better for the baby or he would control what he wanted the baby's name to be and when I was like no he was like well you don't want me involved because you don't want to let me have any like say in the matter like whatever so then like yeah that just like continued until my son was born even though he was still like saying you should have an abortion when my son was born and then I remember like my son was like eight months old or like one or something and I had said, like, well, you never talked to me about adoption. You never talked to me about anything other than abortion. And he was like, well, do you want to give the baby up for adoption? I would have assumed you were bonded by now. And I was like, you want me to give my one-year-old up for adoption? Like, it was just not clicking. So, yeah, it was, like, really about control from the beginning. Like, very much about control from the beginning to the very end. So... I don't know what you're thinking, Nicole, but my feeling is just like, where is this guy's empathy? Like telling you to get an abortion up until you're about to give birth is it it just blows my mind. And it just sounds like there was so much, yes, high control, manipulation, future faking also, right? He want he told you, he gave you this grand vision of what the future would be if you just went through with what he wanted you to do so he's trying to get you the entire time to do what he wants you to do and it's just like oh my gosh I'm so sorry you went through that yeah. so sorry Brett thank you so much for sharing that both of you for sure yeah and I just, I'll just add to that what, what um I mean I think this is such a reminder of the fact that you never know what someone's going through and I think for um teen mothers and teen fathers um, or for parenting college students, like there's so many things that you're experiencing that you're dealing with on a daily basis, you know, parenting while young, parenting while in college, being pregnant while in college, or, you know, having a baby and getting a C-section and six days later having to do a final, like there's so many things that you're going through that people just have no idea. And so I hope that 
you know, one of the takeaways from this is just that we have to be much more supportive of and understanding of um, teen parents and parenting students and young parents um, because you're, they're just, we're, they're dealing with so much. They're trying to juggle so much and emotionally. I can't imagine, Brett, how tough it was to be pregnant and like dealing with everything you're dealing with and then have the father of your child trying to convince you to terminate a pregnancy or, you know, I mean, that's just incredibly difficult on top of everything you've already, you're already dealing with. So I hope people just walk away from this really just understanding the need for all of us to just rally around, you know, anyone who's in this situation, because you never know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well said, well said. Thank you so much for sharing that. Nicole, are teen parents more vulnerable to unhealthy relationships? If so, why might that be? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, we know that um, even before a teen pregnancy comes into the picture, um, girls who are in um, abusive relationships are often more likely to experience the teen pregnancy. Um, so it's very connected. The, the connection between teen pregnancy and abuse is, is very um, strong. And then even after um, you know, a baby is, comes into the picture of pregnancy, you know, we know that there's higher rates of, of abuse and domestic violence among teen parents. There's even research around abuse during pregnancy. Um, and so the connection is, is really strong. And I think it builds on exactly what I was just talking about. I think there's so much shame and stigma attached to a teen pregnancy. Um, and that's really kind of the response that most people have for a young person in that situation. When again, that's the last thing that they need, right? What they need is somebody saying, like, let's talk about what how you're doing let's talk about you know how are you feeling physically emotionally how is your relationship what do you need like how can we help to connect the dots what does your baby need to make sure that you know when they come in the world they're okay um because we do know that the connection between um teen pregnancy and abuse is um is there and it, you know it's it's happening and it's not being talked about most of the focus in those situations is on shaming and stigmatizing um, that young person. And that's the last thing that they need. Gotcha. Brett and Nicole, I'm wondering from your point of view, what are the warning signs of relationship abuse young people, um, young parents um, should be aware of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the warning signs are like very... Um, they're, they're kind of hidden, but kind of not as well. I think that, um, there's a few things that I look for now. Um, one being when a person tells me, oh, you're so emotional or, or you're too emotional, like your emotions run you. And I'm like, or you're not emotional enough. One of the two things is happening here. So um, when someone like tries to make you feel bad for like feeling empathy for people or feeling something for the situation, it's probably not a good thing. And um, being hidden is a big, big sign, like trying to like hide your relationship from the public, but also still keep you like in the bed or whatever. This little thing that people do sometimes um when you feel like you're starting to walk on eggshells around that person like oh I can't say this because they're gonna get mad or oh I shouldn't say that because they're gonna get mad what are they gonna do when they get mad when you start having to wear long sleeves in the summertime you're probably not where you need to be that's probably not a good idea and then when your your friends will tell you for the most part mm -hmm. your friends oh. will tell you what's going on with you they'll be like um I don't like that person. I don't like what's happening. Why are you crying in the middle of the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot at 10 p.m. at night? That's weird. Like, they'll tell you. And a lot of times you'll be like, when you're, you'll start doing this thing, you're like, no, 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 no. See, he's he's really good when we're at home. Like, he really just did yes. this with me last Tuesday. And it really made me feel like a princess. Like, let me tell you about what he did that made me feel like a princess. And they're like... Mm -hmm. So once you start having to do that thing where you're like, no, 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 last Monday, five weeks ago, he was, <laughs> he was really good. Cut it. <laughs>
cut it. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, so many trip bombs you just shared. Also, friends are your greatest resource to anyone who's watching. They are the first people who will tell you the truth mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. about your relationship. Yes. They really will. And Brett, you're so right. If you have to dig for a list of things that they actually yes. did that was like, that made you feel safe and loved and wanted, if you have to search for it, then that could be a warning sign mm -hmm. that something isn't right. Also, if your friends do want to talk to you about your relationship, because from their perspective, they see a lot of like, you know, arguments or, you know, unhealthiness on either of your sides, you know, that's a big red flag um, mm -hmm. to pay attention to for sure. Yep. Definitely. Yeah, those are all great. Um, I, I would just add, I think isolation is a big one. I know that mm -hmm. was something for me. I wasn't uh, connecting with my friends as much. You know, I wasn't um, hanging out as much. Um, I think uh the controlling his controlling nature made it really hard for me to do the things that I did before we were together. You know, he could be critical about friends and critical about, well, why are you going there? You know, are you trying to be some guy? Um, so I think, you know, if you're pulling away from your friends, if you're not hanging out and doing the things that used to make you happy, mm -hmm. like those, that's a big sign that someone is controlling you and trying to, to keep you from connecting with people who care about you, like Brett said, and, and like we just said, like those are your friends, it's your lifeline. Um, so the person you're with should should be in support of you, you know, hanging with those people and connecting with those people. Um, I think another thing is, again, like if you have goals and dreams and aspirations and you start to put those things on hold or you start to um, abandon a lot of those things, that can also be a warning sign. The person that you're with should be just as excited about what you envision for yourself as you are. They should be like, oh yes, go to college. Like, that's amazing. You're so talented. Like you should go and study abroad or, um, you know, whatever it is that you're really passionate about. Like the person you're with, if you're in a healthy relationship should be equally as excited for you to do those things. And I found myself putting a lot of those things on hold because of him and because of the relationship. And that's, that's not healthy. Um, so those are probably two things. Oh, the other thing I would just say, and Brett mentioned this, walking on eggshells, like if you're afraid to talk to somebody about something, like to talk to them about simple things, yeah. um, like that's a huge sign, right? Like I'm afraid to tell this person that I want to, you know, go for a week to this camp or whatever it might be. Like that's a warning sign because you should be able to talk about basic things with that person without them, without being afraid of their reaction. Like I was constantly afraid to talk about simple things. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I saw this person at the store. I would be like, I don't want to mention that because he's going to think I like that guy or he's going to think, you know, and he'll go off. Um, so that's another warning sign. Like if you're feeling like you can't talk about basic stuff, mention basic things, that's, that's an indication that you're with someone, you're probably in a really unhealthy relationship. And I just wanted to add one thing because you said critical and it made me be like, oh, that's the one. Um, when you um, are starting to like be afraid to do things that you like or that you think are cool because they are constantly making fun of the things that you like. So like I, and it's so embarrassing, but I super like show tunes. Like that's what I listen to in my car. I would that never guess. Matter. I love it. So I would never have guessed that, Brett. Do you sing show tunes too? Will I you do. sing one? For really? Yes. Badly, like singing show tunes in my shower. Like it's really embarrassing. <laughs> but and I was the one who had a car, right? So like when we were in my car, we would listen to my music. And I always knew to turn my music off before he got in the car. Because if he came in and heard that I was listening to that music, he would laugh at me like fully and be like, wow that's so stupid that's so stupid that you like that like or if i'd be like he'd be like what do you want to watch on tv i wouldn't want to tell him because like what i wanted to watch i knew he thought that was stupid and so i just didn't want to feel dumb anymore i didn't want to feel small so i just wouldn't i would just be like whatever you want so i think that's another one that's like Dee. yeah if your partner makes you feel dumb or small it's unhealthy period yeah, yeah. pretty much <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. And also, I just wanted to say, like, it's one thing, guys, who are watching, 
young people who are watching, it's one thing to not have the same interest as your partner. That's totally fine and normal. But if your partner makes you feel belittled because of it, if they make you feel bad because of something you like as simple as show tunes, then something about that is not healthy. It's not right. Also, I just want to uplift uh, Tremenda5 says pressuring to have as one of the signs of unhealthy pressuring you to have um, pressuring you to give over your password um, to your emails or social media is a big yes. red flag as well. And um, I did want to also uplift Wit PR says phenomenal conversation, ladies. Good job. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I'm so glad you guys are getting something into it. And if you have made it to um, this point of the video and you're watching the replay, please go ahead and comment in one loves comment section another red flag in relationships people should be aware of. Um, ladies, both of you, I am wondering, what do you, in your opinion, feel adults should know in order to help young people who are in need? Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> That's a really good one. I think the big thing, um, you know, we work with um, a population of young people that has been really um, mistreated. It's it really judged, um, really ostracized. And um, I think one of the big things is that that there needs to be trust. They, they, they need to feel like you're a person that they're safe with that isn't gonna judge them, that isn't going to um, make them feel bad about their decisions. And I think unfortunately that is happening too often, especially in schools, especially in educational spaces where um, you are you feel like you don't have people in those spaces who understand you, who care about you, and who um, are, are going to love and accept you for who you are, no matter what your decisions are. And so um, I think it's so, you know, getting to a place where someone discloses something like, I'm in this relationship and it's unhealthy, or, you know, my boyfriend or my girlfriend physically, you know, hit me last night or did something last night. Like that's such a private thing that requires a level of trust. And I think for many young people, like we, we often ask um, our scholars when they come into the program, like how many relationships do you, healthy relationships with adults do you have? And of course we have some who come in, they have great family support, but we have others who come in who will say, I don't have a single healthy relationship with, you know, an adult or a person in my life. And that's just really sad to think about you're moving through life, especially for our students who are all parents, trying to go to college, working, they have so much on their plates. Many of them, unfortunately, are in situations where there's domestic violence. And they don't have one person that they feel safe with. They, ha they don't have one person that they can t trust and talk to about what's going on in their lives. So um, a big message that I try to get out to people, whether it's a around mental health, domestic violence, or you know anything going on with young people is how are, how are you making sure that you're a safe person for the young people that you're working with? How are you communicating to them that they can trust you, um, that you're not gonna judge them, that you're going to accept them for who they are and that you're not going to you know, hold their decisions against them. Um, and I think that that's the biggest thing, because once those that safety is there, then you can really connect with young people and help them in the situations that they're going through. But but that's what we need more of. And I think, unfortunately, in too many of our spaces, including, you know, churches, um, you know, we've had nightmare stories of, of the way that young people have been treated in church settings because of their decisions. So we need more safe spaces with people and educators and adults who, um, who really can show up for students and create an atmosphere and an environment where they can trust. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. This is, this is like my favorite topic ever. <laughs> so, um, because I think that it's so it's such a big thing that nobody thinks about nobody even like thinks about it and for me it's the biggest thing because I remember when I was a teenager I was dying and nobody was seeing me and mm -hmm. the reason they weren't seeing me is because a lot of adults do not think of teenagers or middle schoolers as people they think of them as adolescents
they're like, wow, she's being so like ornery because she's an adolescent. No, she's probably being ornery because she's being abused behind closed doors and nobody is seeing her. Like, you know what I'm saying? And so once you start thinking about abuse as less of an adult problem, why are you in adult business? And more about problems throughout the ages, all of them, I feel like the doors would start to open up to save these young girls and boys who are going through these adult things at 15, 14, 13, mm-hmm. 12. And um, yeah, there's just, I mean, there there were just times where like people would say things to me and they would not do anything else about it. Like I remember um, my partner at the time, my baby's father, he broke my collarbone in high school. And mm-hmm. so I had to walk around in the sling and my history teacher, he saw me and he co- he walks up to me in the middle of the hallway and he goes, he'll probably do it again. So you should probably just leave. And then he walked away. He didn't help me. He didn't take me to a counselor. I had to walk around school. The, after that, like nobody said anything except for, yeah, well, it'll probably happen again. So you, sh- you should leave. Like, why would you put that on a child? Like, how am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to do? And I think that's what adults do a lot of they're like well we're giving you this information so do something with it and that's not how children operate they i mean like at 16 you think you're so grown you think that you know everything you think you know life you think that you're the only person who's ever been through something and the thing is is like you are still a child you're still a child when you're 18 i don't care what anybody says you're still a child when you're 16 15 17 however old you think you are you're still a kid and adults need to treat you like who you are they need to give you like something. a person they you something they need to bring you to an adult who can help you they need to bring the the resources to you because what i mean like what was i gonna do to walk into a police station by myself like i didn't want to do that i was scared so like once we give teenagers this resources that will help them and give them the knowledge to know like this will what happen if you do this this and this like they will probably want to come and do something for themselves instead of just suffering in silence like yes yeah, it's just not don't do that adults don't do that <laughs> yeah i mean so often without even realizing it i think adults and sometimes even friends mirror the abuse someone is experiencing in a relationship Mm-hmm. either by trying to push them into a decision um, or force them to make a decision when they're not ready um, or manipulate them in some way. I'm sure adults do this thinking and believing that they're being helpful when actual, in all actuality it's not. And Brad, I don't know about you, but sometimes I often wonder about intersectionality when it comes to this subject. Would your, you know, m- music teacher had approached you the same way if you were like had a different identity or you know, showed up different, you know what I'm saying? I always think about these things sometimes um, when it comes to this subject, because I often feel like, and I know you kind of, you touched on this, Nicole, in your book, Pregnant Girl, like how, you know, intersectionality, how race and gender and all these things kind of interplay and either, you know, put you in a space where, you know, you have greater access to resources and help and people are willing and wanting to help you or not so much, you know? Um, So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great point. And um, I think when we talk about safe spaces and being um, and how young people are treated, we have to talk about race. And we know that things are different if you are a black or brown child, mm-hmm. a black or brown teen. You know, if you are a, a young black man, a, you know, a, a, a young black uh, male in school and there's an issue that comes up, the the the. Um, at people at your school, your teachers are more likely to call the police than they are the guidance counselor yeah. or your parents. If you are a, um, uh, a black or brown girl, and this is especially true for black girls, you're more likely to get suspended um, for infractions that your white counterparts are not going to get suspended for. Um, so there's research and data that supports that. And, and that can begin as early as preschool, which is so, you know, when we think about um, what children need, you know, starting at a very young age, this is happening. So absolutely intersectionality plays into it. And I think it's important for people to name 
the role of race in this work and um, especially when it comes to domestic violence and and again, you know, who deserves help and who doesn't deserve help. Um, and I think, you know, Brett, that, that what you described is just, it's horrible to think that that would be a reaction that you would get, again, at a time where you needed someone to show up for you and say, hey, like, what can I do? You know, how can I help you? Um, and again, I think, you know, the earlier point, sometimes that's not, let me take you to a domestic violence shelter right now. Sometimes it's just, I need to talk to someone. I need to share what's happening. You know, I need a listening ear. I need to know what my options are. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we know that those conversations are less likely to happen for black and brown youth. And, and that's another thing that I think educators and adults um, can really think about, you know, how, how to overcome that, how to show up differently. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's like, when you're a kid, you are trained to think that what adults think is like the law. Like when you just go into a doctor and you just trust them because they're the doctor, like whatever, you don't ask so many questions. Well, when an adult comes to somebody in that situation and says something of that nature that just like brushes it off, well, now I'm thinking, okay, it's, maybe it's not that big of a deal because you clearly don't think it's a big deal and maybe it's not that big of a deal. Like, at least I didn't get my head bashed in, you know what I mean? So I'm thinking, like, it's not that big of a deal. But, like, we need to we need to make big deals out of what is big deals. Otherwise, kids are not going to think it's big deal. They're going to be wow. like, oh, it is what it is. Like, that's fine. But if you start making a big deal out of things that are big deal, kids are going to be like, oh, maybe this is wrong maybe this is not right like so that's what adults jobs are to protect children in their care and that's one way to do it well said i love it um yeah, yeah. thank you so much thank you for sharing that brett as all good great points i hope you guys are taking notes who have joined <laughs> Um, <laughs> nicole what services does generation hope offer that you wish you had as a teen parent yeah. Um, so uh, our direct work with um, with young parents and college is really it's a wraparound holistic model. So, um, yes, our goal is to help teen moms and dads earn their college degrees. But on any given day, we're doing um, we're helping with all the ancillary things that come up for students. Uh, I, we could help you proofread an English paper tomorrow and on Friday help you out of a domestic violence situation. It really just runs the full gamut. And that's intentional because, um, you know, the reason that young parents aren't completing college at the same rate as, as their peers is not academics. It's not because they aren't incredibly smart. Um, it's because of life. It's because a lot of the things that we're talking about today. And so it's really important that we have programs that are really focused on the whole person and everything that might be going on, whether it's domestic violence or I can't afford childcare or we can't put food on the table tonight. Um, so we were really intentional in designing a program that shows up for our students in all of the different ways that they might need us to show up for them um, and knowing that that's different from person to person and 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 that's okay and that's great um, but so the basic um, uh, kind of components of our direct service work are we provide emotional and financial support so um, on the financial side we provide tuition assistance we have an emergency fund in any that can help our students in any crisis situation that comes up um, we also collect tangible items from the community so anything from laptops to baby wipes to gas cards you know to help our students get to class. Um, and then on the emotional side, we have a robust mentoring program. So each of our students is matched with a caring individual in the community um, who really is there to be a cheerleader and to, to say, yes, you can do it. You may have a teething baby at 2 a.m. and a midterm the next day, but like we believe in you and you can do this. Um, we have a, an amazing program staff and they're what we call hope coaches. And our hope coaches also work with all of our students to help them navigate college and life and all the things that happen. And um, we have a whole mental health um, program with a licensed counselor on our staff. We have a career readiness program so that we're not just focused on helping our scholars get through college, but to get that job, that first job out of college that's going to be critical. Um, and then they're surrounded by 120 plus other uh, teen parents in college who are also experiencing the same things that they're experiencing. I think one of the things that I realized very early on when I started school, I had a three month old baby. I was a freshman, you know, on a college campus for the first time. I felt completely isolated, like 
looking around at my peers, they weren't experiencing what I was experiencing. They were living a totally different life. They weren't parenting. And I went to a predominantly white institution where I was also one of very few black students. So I definitely felt othered and marginalized in a lot of different ways. And it's really powerful where when you, you can look at a village around you of people who are going through the same things that you're going through. Um, and so that is really helpful. So we bring the group together. Also, we do fun stuff like Valentine's Day parties and even in COVID, we had a holiday drive through uh, a holiday party with Santa waving. And so we do also the social things to try to bring the group together and, and create connections there. Um, and then on the, on, on the national side, we are doing a lot of work to really create systemic change for parenting college students and teen parents. So we work with colleges and universities to help them transform their campuses to be more family friendly. I think, um, Brett, what you described as being a new mom and, you know, having to transition um, six days later up from a C-section to take a final and, um, and I know nursing and trying to breastfeed and trying to find a lactation room on a college campus is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Like these are things that have to change across higher ed if we're really going to be more supportive of parenting students. So we're working with colleges and universities to create that change. Um, we're also, we just launched a policy and advocacy agenda all about removing the barriers that exist at the federal and the regional level for parenting college students. So looking at childcare, looking at economic mobility opportunities, looking at affordability of higher ed, all of those things. And then lastly, we release research and reports. So um, we want to help to tell the story story of what it's like to be a parenting college student. So many people, um, they just don't know. And so how can we help to illuminate what's going on day to day for incredible young parents like Brett and, and all of our other students? And so we, we regularly release reports to help to tell that story. Gotcha. All great things. And I just wanted to let you know, Kevin Bernard said thank you as you were speaking. So I just wanted to share that with the both of you. Um, Brett, how did your experience as a teen parent influence your decision to be a part of Generation Hope? Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> um, my friend, like I had never heard of Generation Hope in my existence. Mm. And my friend, shout out to you, Sally. She, she <laughs> sent me a tweet and she was like, she was like, hey, look at this. And I was like, what is this? And she's like, I don't know, but money's involved. So you <laughs> like it. Oh, there she goes. She joined right now. Shout out to you, Sally. Thank um, you, Sally. Hi, Thank Sally. Sally. <laughs> Sally. <laughs> so she was like, I don't know, Brad, but you like money. And I was like, you're right. So I like, I went in and I, and I started looking and I was like, what? You're lying. <laughs> I was like, mentor. And the, by the way, this is when I was like spiraling like super bad. Yeah. I was like, I was in like an anxiety ridden, just like, it was just a mess. So, <laughs> like, mentor, yes. So, I like, uh, I just applied because yeah, I do how I do. And I just applied. And um, they called me when I was at the dermatologist, like three months later. And they were like, oh, you got in. And I was like, oh. Oh, yay so then like I I I got in and um it was it was really helpful for me because I was I was struggling with like book book fees and like uh child care fees because I was I was doing this thing back and forth with the state of Maryland about the vouchers and I was like who has eleven hundred dollars a month? <laughs> like I don't. And so I um, when they like gave me like scholarship money, it helped me to pay childcare money, and I was like wonderful. And then also there was this other like mentorship part where they they matched me with this this wonderful lady, and she she was a she was a black woman, and that was really important and to me because there was like a racial issue and there has always been like a race issue when you're when you're when you are one race and your parents are a parent that you live with is a different race and so for me to have a black woman be with me and like not think that I was like bad for my mm. decisions in my life because she's like an older mother and I'm a younger mother. She had her baby older and I had mine way younger. 
but she never judged the situation like she was like that's fine like you Mm -hmm. and you rocked it and I was like oh yeah so I'm not crazy (laughs) like I'm not a statistic and she was like no and I was like oh huh like that's interesting so it was just really helpful and like she was already within the community because her son goes to the school my mom teaches at. So, like, mm. she was at all of those events, too, with my mom's school with her kid. And then, like, my kid came. And then, like, we had known her through Generation Hope. And we're like, hey, like, that's my girl. So, like, it was interesting to see the intersectionality between Generation Hope and, like, life in this place where we live. And so that was very helpful. And it's just, like, it's always you always need more when you're a teen yeah. parent like you always need more support like you can never get enough support so in my mind I was like that's fine like I if you're gonna give me support I'm gonna apply because I need it like you can never have enough when you're yeah. teen, when you're a mother a yeah parent in general you can never have enough so amen so I was like that's fine I will do that today <laughs> and um yeah, it was, it's been really good. It's been really great. And it's given me this opportunity to talk about some stuff that I have always wanted to talk about with people. So thank you, God, to Nicole. That's <laughs> the coolest for doing this. Oh, um, my God. I love that. Yeah. Yes, thank you to Nicole. Um, and on that note, Nicole, where can people find out more about Generation Hope? You, and yeah. you have a lot of parts, too, Brett. I think a lot of people will agree with you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, so you can go to generationhope.org and that's our website and you can find a ton of information there. We're actually recruiting right now for um, our next class of scholars. So Brett, tell your friends, be a Sally and tell be your friends. Sally. Uh, yes, be a Sally. Um, so if you are uh, if you know a teen mom or teen dad in the D.C. metro area, so D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, tell them to apply if they want some help going to college. Um, our applications due April 1st. We're also looking for mentors. So if you are looking to mentor, uh, we are looking for people to match with that incoming class of scholars, and those applications are open now as well. Um, but yeah, we have a ton of information. You can find our reports on our website, volunteer opportunities these ways to give time or treasure um we just you know we're a big happy community happy family and we love to you know work with people in any way that you'd like to give back there are plenty of ways to do that um you can also find us on instagram we're at support gen hope um on instagram and twitter so uh, support gen hope and um and yeah we're we're also on facebook at generation hope and and you can find us there too Amazing. And for those of you who have joined us live, um, Grace actually went ahead and put generationhope.org in the comment section in case anyone is looking for the website. (laughs) And if you are watching the replay, please do hashtag have a friend like Sally. (laughs) Hashtag have a friend like Sally. Yes. Yes. Have a friend like Sally. So we know that you made it all the way to the end of this video. Um, Last but not least, I did just want to call out, we talked about a lot of different things during this live, some of it being relationship abuse. If you or someone you know is in an abusive relationship, please reach out to the National Domestic Violence Hotline. There you will connect with a peer advocate who can help you um, with a safety plan so that you can safely exit the situation. Um, The phone number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline is 1-800-799-7233. You can always also go to One Love's um, Real-Time Resources, um, and you will find a lot of different resources on that page, Um, tech support, phone support, and so, so much more. So definitely go there. And for anyone who has made it to the end, if you're interested in taking action for healthy relationships in your community, you can join One Love's new initiative called Move for Love. Find out more and sign up at moveforlove.org. Thank you so much. And thank you both so much. This was great. I'm so thank excited. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you so both. much. This was great. Thank you, Brett. That's wonderful. I can't wait. I haven't met Brett in person because we've been in remote mode for yeah. since March 2020, but we're slowly coming out of it. And then I'll have to meet you in person soon, Brett. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> this was like the best girl chat. <laughs> it was. I know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a great evening. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.